The following interview was conducted <coughs> with Professor Victor W. Bridewell for the Pre-University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, September the 11th, 2008, at his office on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings and your early years. Well, I um, uh, was born in London in 1929, and um, I had no siblings. So what did your parents do? Were they born and raised there? Or? Yes, um, my father worked for the British government, for the British Air Ministry, and uh, we came to America in 1941, when he was shipped over in 39. Uh, my mother and I joined him in 40, 40 or 41 um, in Canada and subsequently in the U.S. and subsequently uh, and during the Second World War in Washington, D.C. And um, I went to school in Where Washington, D.C. Where did you go to your early, early years and then high school? Tell yes, I, I came over to about age 11 and I went to... Just in uh, Canada? Um, no, this was in England. I went to school in England through 11, um, through junior high school in Washington, D.C., went to a private school in Canada through high school, and uh, then went to um, um, college in Washington, D.C., and subsequently to graduate school in Wisconsin and Kansas and postdoc at Berkeley and then started teaching in UC San Francisco Medical School back in 58. Okay. Uh, Just that Tell us a little about what college was like. Um, where, what school did you go to and what campus life? Yeah, well, the college I went to doesn't exist anymore. It's called Wilson Teachers College. If you grow up in the District of Columbia, there is no state university which you can attend. And uh, you're an out-of-state student from Maryland and Virginia and anything else. So the teacher's college was quite inexpensive, and my father had died when I was in high school, so it was only $50 a semester. So actually, my primary degree is in secondary teaching, in chemistry education. Did you live on campus, or were you? No, no, there was no campus. Oh, the so only campus, well, the Wilson Teacher's College at the time was in a condemned elementary school on 11th and Harvard Streets, and its campus consisted of two asphalt uh, tennis courts. My, how large was the school? And the and the, you couldn't have more than eleven people up on the second story at any one time. How large was it? What an interesting. Yes. Yes, it was, I made some good friends there. Uh, Were there some student activities? Did they have any athletics at all? Oh no, <laughs> nothing like that. Um, there were, this is the, in the segregated days. The the, uh, the black folks went to minor teachers' college. Uh, these subsequently became amalgamated. Um, um, I would say maybe 15, 20 years ago, as, as um, U University of District of Columbia, when they inter integrated the two and got rid of both those things. So the, the facilities were sort of basic. And there was a grungy little coffee shop across uh, from the campus and we used to uh, meet there with people. It was nice because um, I, um, there were only about four of us majoring in chemistry and um, so we got to meet with people in various other fields. So it was it was a, f a friendly sort of an atmosphere. Right. Well, how, what was the enrollment? Was it very large? Oh, I really don't know. No, it was not large. I think my graduating class was probably 25 or 30, maybe something like that. I, d I really don't know. But your error was on the small side. It was on the small side. <laughs> but I fortunately, um, I, I never really liked the education courses very much. And I got a job uh, while I was a senior year working at the medical school of George Washington University in downtown, uh, just doing odd jobs in the physiology department. Um, unlike state universities, uh, George Washington University Medical School back in the uh, late 40s uh, had minimal support. So um, the support staff they had were people like me who got hired to do things. Uh, there were a bunch of... Um, uh, janitors there, but that was about it. So I painted the place, I helped fix equipment, I um, at one point helped install lighting in the, in the walls, uh, all sorts of things to make Very it going. Good. And then when I subsequently went to Wisconsin, after I finished my master's degree at George Washington, I was amazed to find what the facilities were like in the state institution. I mean, Madison was just magnificent. I had no idea that universities could be that nice. We were, we were in a building, uh, it was built in 1823, and, uh, and uh, as I say, it was uh, falling to pieces pretty much. So. <laughs> How did you happen to select, what, did you do your master's then after college you went to a George yeah, I, well, I started working for the physiology department, and then the um, at George Washington, at George Washington, which is in the, me the old medical school. It now has a nice medical school, but at the moment it was in this old medical school building, had been for many years, and. Um, I got a job in the pharmacology department, actually 
helping as a research assistant. And then I got, doing that, I got my master's in biochemistry. There were no assistantships or money available in biochemistry, but there was money to pay me in pharmacology. So I actually did pharmacology research, but got my degree in biochem. And then I got some very good advice for the, from the then chairman of um, George Washington University Biochem Department, a guy named Joseph Rowe. And he said, um, um, and this is talking about his own department, he said, Vic, get out of here and go to a good university. I said, what do you mean, Dr. Ray? He said, why don't you go to Wisconsin? So I did, and that was, of course, very good advice. You'd never, you, that was your first visit there? You'd never, oh, you'd never, never been, been outside never the been Northeast there. at all? No, that's right, I had not. And so uh, at that time, this would be 50, 51, uh, Wisconsin was the leading light in biochemistry, I would say, among the American universities. And I was there for a couple of years. Oh, but I, um, that was rather funny. Um, my undergraduate record was not all that great. Like I said, I really wasn't interested in, in, in a lot of the coursework there. The only thing I really that wanted was in teachers' college. In, in teachers' in college, teacher, right. and the George Washington, I did well in, grad, in my master's degree, but unfortunately, the, the grading system they had in place was uh, was pass fail. So, so uh, while I actually made A's um, in graduate school, not in undergraduate school, uh, I had no uh, no letter grade. No, 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 um, no. Um, way to prove that I was really a good student. No so, GPA, right? No GPA, right. And so um, getting in Wisconsin was pretty difficult. I had to come up with my own fellowship. And uh, that was a little difficult because I was still an American, still a British citizen at the time. And most of that, that precludes you from most fellowships. But I managed to dig one up uh, from the Helen Hay Whitney Foundation. And um, the reason I was interested in them, they were interested in um, rheumatic heart disease. And my research was on salicylates, which is one of the palliative treatments for rheumatic heart disease. And so I wrote them and said, you know, any possibility of a pre-doctoral fellowship? And they said, well, we've never given a pre-doctoral fellowship before, but our, our head will come down to Washington and interview you. And so I'm the one and only recipient of a pre-doctoral fellowship from the Helen Hay Whitney Foundation, which is a famous foundation. They normally do postdocs. Oh, Whitney is a good, well-known yeah, name. Yeah. So uh, that gave me my fellowship, and I, I got married uh, and went off to Wisconsin and was there for a couple of years. Then my, the professor with whom I was working took a, a named chair at the University of Kansas. So I decided to go with him. And uh, Had you finished your, your coursework? Yes, that was a problem right there because um, I got to Kansas and um, took my prelim exams, which are necessary for passing a PhD, whereupon the dean mm. of the graduate school, having heard of this, invalidated them. He said, you can't take the um, prelims at Kansas. You've never had a course at Kansas. And uh, he was an English major, I should say, not a, not a scientist. And so he invalidated my prelims. And I had to take a course and, uh, and then retake them a, a semester later, which was pretty painful. I think graduate school was much more painful than those days. I, I thought uh, my feeling about graduate school, although I got along fine with my professor, was that it's a very, very, very painful experience. Uh, you're not supposed to like it. And you probably had the language required, didn't they have the language Oh, yes, uh, French Which and German. You? Yes. I had to pass French at GW and, and, uh, and then at Wisconsin and then also at, um, at Kansas because nobody ever accepts anybody else's language requirements, right? <laughs> and then I, but I, 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 I've talked to people who had to sweat through that language. Well, Latin know. was not one of the ones <laughs> that I would have known. <laughs> I'll tell you one, but it was really funny about somebody else. There was a chap at, um, at Berkeley at the time I was at Kansas who I knew about because uh, he was working on a very similar research problem. I hadn't met him, Lou Pizer. And the person who gave the German exams at Berkeley was a guy named H.A. Barker, who was a very well-known biochemist, a very, 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 very an excellent biochemist, and, and a very, not a demanding person, but, but a person of strict standards. Understood, right. Um, Louis Pizer failed his German exam 13 times. Can you imagine? No. <laughs> they, they don't do that these days, do they? <laughs> three, time, three strikes and you're out, right? Something yeah, like something that. like well, that. Well, they don't have to, isn't that requirement? It's not the same. No, yet. that's right. We got rid yeah. of the requirement. Did they ever have, uh, would Greek or Latin have qualified, or did it have to be one of the romance? Well, not in, not in the sciences, as far as I know. <laughs> Possibly in <Probably>. other fields. <laughs> Probably in religion or something like that. <laughs> so uh, so that, so my, uh, my, um, you college finished? career um, progressed from uh, um, 
this teacher's college to a part-time job at uh, GW to a master's at GW to cross work at Wisconsin, which was fine, to a final degree at Kansas. I was actually at the medical school in Kansas City. It wasn't even at Lawrence. And I had the commute to take the course 40 miles to Lawrence. And then, um, then I, uh, I was finishing up and my professor said, well, you ought, maybe you ought to take a postdoctoral position. I said, okay. So I wrote to some people and got an offer from this guy, Esmond Snell, who was a chair of Texas um, down in Austin. I said, okay, I'll come down to Austin. So I'm about to go to Austin, and uh, he wrote back and said, don't come to Austin, I just took the chair at Berkeley. So I said, okay, I'll come to Berkeley. So I spent about 18 months as a postdoc at Berkeley and had a wonderful time there, and then got offered a job at the medical school. Um, uh, the medical school at UC... Yes, this is at Berkeley? Yeah, UC uh, well, Berkeley. well, let me explain that. Uh, you, it's the University of California. Yes, it's Berkeley's medical school, so to speak, but it isn't in Berkeley. There was, as you know, a big quake in 06 in San Francisco, and the medical school in, I guess, 07 moved back to Berkeley. And in 58, the year I took a job, it was the year they moved it back. They moved it back from Berkeley to San Francisco, so therefore I went to San Francisco. We had what we called the banana box crusade. Uh, because all the equipment had to be boxed up into ban banana boxes and carted across the bay <laughs> into <laughs> San Francisco. <laughs> so that was okay. I had a job there, and, and that was all right. Um, it was sort of a funny thing. Um, I had this job, so I'm an assistant professor. I'm 29 years old. So the, the chairman said, um, here's your office, okay, and here's your lab. So I sat down there and I thought, <clears throat> so, sooner or later somebody may come in and tell me something, you know, like what I'm expected to do. Nobody ever did. You were there. I was just there, yes. <laughs> they didn't give you any instructions or any mentoring or anything like that in those days. It's, You're on your own, right? You're on your own. Well, I mean, they did say eventually, uh, I want you to teach this course. I mean, you know, that's okay. Yeah, so it's on your own. Didn't they tell you where to pick up your paycheck or anything like that? No. <laughs> Well, I, I, the reason I say it's, it's a contrast yeah. like that is, yeah, is, that, is that people worry an awful lot about mentoring young people and so forth, and I certainly got some good mentoring in the sense that Joe Rowe told me to go to, to um, Madison, and my own professor was very supportive for me uh, and, and tra tra um, tracked me off to a good postdoc, and my postdoctoral advisor was always very supportive. So it isn't that I haven't been mentoring, but the I job, did. but not on the job. <laughs> That was another layer. That was another, that was another You figure, you know, you're a professor now. You don't need any advice. <laughs> you're on your own. On your own, yes. Uh, so anyway. <laughs> well, well, you were talking about family. Did you meet your wife then in Washington? Or George yes, Washington? she was the secretary at George Washington in the, uh, in the biochem department. Okay. So I met her. Yeah. Did you have, do you have any children? Oh, we have four kids, yes. Oh. And are, did they didn't go to Purdue? Um, our second son uh, has got two, two degrees from Purdue in business, mm -hmm. and um, uh, let's see, Keith, Keith took a lot, you know, they all attended Purdue part, part time, some of the time, but the only one who got degrees at Purdue was our second son, and the others have got, all got degrees, but they got them in other ways. Do any live in, in close by or in Indiana? Or? Our daughter's back here in Indiana now. She married a chap um, in, uh, from around here. He, he was in the Marines for a while, for five years, and then they moved back here. So they live in town, oh, but uh, the other kids know. Yeah. All right, after your postdoc, mm. then what comes next? So you sort of covered the career path before you came to Purdue. Was the next thing that you come to Purdue? or? Yes, uh, uh, I, came, I came there. There was... Um, uh, there was a problem. My job, job sort of dissolved in San Francisco. Uh, this, this was uh, this, no, no. This oh. is uh, the actual job. Um, um, University of California rules and regs are that after six years you have to be reviewed for promotion to associate. Well, that's what the record says, uh, but it doesn't work if the dean refuses to forward your files for promotion. And the problem was that our chairmanship was vacant. The dean of the medical school had been thrown out by an internal revolution and uh, and um, uh, the dean said frankly he said Vic I need your position to hire a new person so even though the rules said I should have been reviewed for promotion they never reviewed me and even at this late date uh, I have I have a bitter feeling about that so fortunately I got a job here which was much nicer how did you hear about the, the 
position that was here. Did you come and then you come for an interview? Well, ultimately, yes, but it happens in funny ways. Um, Barney Axelrod, who was the chair of this department, maybe you remember yeah. Barney, uh, came, he was visiting for the National Institutes of Health, and he visited the department where I was in San Francisco at a time when I was out someplace. I was, I don't know, maybe it was at a grant meeting or something. I was at a meeting. I was not there, but he talked to my graduate students. And uh, apparently they made a good impression, as my graduate students always have. And um, then we were back at a meeting, and one of my graduate students was with me, and we bumped into Dr. Axelrod, who I did not know. And Axelrod said to my graduate student, I've got this position open. Do you know anybody who's looking for a job? And my graduate student looked at me and said, uh, Dr. Axelrod, I think you two need to talk to each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like you know, things happen in funny ways. So I guess I was in view here, and I was the first person that Barney hired. And, Had uh, he just become the department? He'd just become chair. Oh, okay. And he hired me, and then I, I helped him hire some other people and restructure the department and, and so on. Was it in, were you in this building at that time? Yes, I've always been in this building. Okay, so biochem has been in this building all the time. Yes, except that it, it's expanded now. It has labs in uh, Hanson and in, uh, and in Whistler. Okay. But at the time, it was all here. Okay, okay. Let's talk a little about your teaching responsibility and go to talk a little about your research area and moving along? Well, I'm what they call an enzymologist, so I teach the way uh, enzymes work, and I taught a um, lecture course in that, sub, in that specialty and lab, but I also taught um, the two, what was the uh, sophomore general biochemistry for ag majors, mainly for ag majors, I should say, and I taught that for some years, uh, and the lab associated with it, that's now a 300 level course, I think it was 200 at the time. And then, for the most time, I taught um, one of the two semesters of the two-semester senior level course, a 500 level course, which is for majors and for um, frequently for graduates in other fields, other ag fields like animal science and entomology and so forth. So it has about a 50-50 graduate student um, and um, undergraduate population. And those classes run around 100, something like that. So I taught that for many, many years. Enough to get tired of teaching the same material, I should say. I was not sorry to stop teaching it. I mean, it was okay, but, uh, but you, you think, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Were you serving on faculty committees? What faculty committees did you have very many of them in those days? Or since you were the second person, they probably, you could make a comment on that. There weren't very many. Or maybe there were. Um, I don't have any very strong recollections of that, tell okay. you the truth. Uh, well, there probably was a curriculum committee, of course. There's we okay. never, well, oh, um, well, in late years here, um, we never had enough faculty to have a curriculum committee. I've served as the curriculum coordinator for the school. In other words, they always say, you know, meet with your committee, and I say, you're looking at it, you know. <laughs> we don't have enough people. Well, see, the faculty was, uh, has been about 15 people for uh, until almost the entire time I've been here. Okay. There just aren't that many people that do committees, so sure. we try and avoid them if possible. Oh. God, uh, God so loved the world, he didn't create a committee. I have a friend who's got that on his wall. <laughs> <laughs> this has nothing to do with the interview, but my friend Henry Weiner, who you will perhaps interview, is quite a, quite a character, and uh, he says a number of funny things. And I remember one time we were sitting around the table, about eight or nine of us, uh, trying to decide who was going to volunteer to sit on some committee or other, because none of us wanted to do it. And Weiner said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. This is many years ago. He said, everybody throw $5 on the table said, uh, if nobody will volunteer and pick up the money, throw another five dollars in the table, and eventually somebody will volunteer. <laughs> we didn't do that, mind you, but I thought it was a heck of an idea. Yeah, I'm right. <laughs> well, you could get out of it at five dollars. So, um, did the, how about the enrollment over time? Is that, uh, and in, both the in, undergrad and the graduate? The well, it's grown, of course, but um, I wouldn't say so dramatically. Um, in, in terms of the graduate enrollment, it's actually dropped. Um, we had more graduate school applicants when, uh, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s than we do today. And of course the compositions changed, that whereas they were all Americans back then, uh, now they're um, probably 50%, um, well maybe 40% uh, Oriental, let's say, Chinese primarily, but not exclusively, Koreans also and some Japanese. Um, and the other thing that's changed, of course, is the number of women that there were relatively few women in biochemistry uh, from my early days, but of course that's changed a lot. Sure. So uh, we're, um, 
uh, not as heavily w uh, women oriented as biology is, but by, by the, by the, but they're by no means underrepresented sure, in, in biochemistry anymore. Right, okay. Will you talk a little bit about your research uh, areas? Uh, sure. You're in uh, HMG and your CLA synthase. Well, um, you get started on a certain area, and sometimes you work, work on it for a long, long time. Um, the enzyme that I've I've studied most is this enzyme HMG-CoA reductase, and it's familiar to most people as the target of statin drugs, which are used to reduce uh, cholesterol. And if you have somebody or know somebody who takes statin drugs, the reason they work is that they're competitive inhibitors of this enzyme in, in your liver and skin and kidneys and so forth. But my interest has not been in drug development, but in mechanistic observations of how does the enzyme work. It's a reasonably complex enzyme, and um, that has gone through year, early years before molecular biology, where we used to isolate the enzyme from uh, rat liver or some similar tissue like that, uh, through to the years when we uh, learned how to clone, one of my graduate students learned how to clone the gene out from, um, uh, from, from, from DNA, uh, from, not, from, uh, not from rat liver in this case, but from a microorganism. And then we could express the enzyme uh, in, in E. coli, which is really a much, much nicer way to do things. So, and then um, back in the early 90s, um, um, I was singing in the, uh, continued to sing in the Episcopal Choir down at St. John's downtown, and I met a lady um, who was singing alto, as my wife does, which is Cynthia Stoffker, who's on the biology faculty here, but we didn't know each other. And I said, she said, I said, what do you do? She says, I'm a crystallographer. And I said, oh, really? You know, I've got a, I've got a protein that might interest you. And from that chance meeting in choir grew a collaboration which has been and still continuing going on with her, where she does the structural stuff, and I do the enzymology on this enzyme and on some related enzymes. So, like many things in life, chance encounters uh, work out well for you. So that's been a very productive relationship for me because, um, see, that I mean, that's one of the structures. They, that's HMG CoA reductase there, and that's HMG CoA synthase structure there. But those were structures worked out in her lab nice to have. by her students. So that's where the research has, has gone. Um, and you're still continuing on with it. Well, at a very low key at this point, yes. I mean, it depends. If there's some of her students who, well, there's, there's one working out there part time, and another one I was advising last week who's doing some stuff. So on and off, on and off. Sure. Right. Right. Okay. Oh, we do still have a continuing project going on with, with a group in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, I should say. But anyway. Mm -hmm. So there have been, you talked about changes in the department. How about department heads? You, uh, Dr. Axelrod, and there have been others since then? Yes. Um, let's see. What was the, uh, let's see. Well, I knew Forrest Quackenbush, too, who was before him. Uh, um, he had just stepped down from there. And Forrest just died last year, uh, just short of 100. Um, it's, you know, there have been others that I've heard of Sam that they just couldn't make it very close. There was a well, he got within a month, I think. We were planning a, planning a 100th birthday out of his anniversary for it. Anyway. Now, he wrote, incidentally, a, um, and you might want to look it up, he wrote a, a sort of a history of the department at some point. You, I don't know if you know that. No, I'll make a note on that. Um, in fact, Quackenbush wrote this. He was ch chair from 47 onwards, I think. That's going way back. And I've seen this volume. It should be around somewhere. Okay. Sure. Uh, Quackenbush, let's see. Axelrod stepped down for Carlson, I guess. Don Carlson came next. And, oops, who was the next chair? Carlson. Carlson. Um, oh, I guess Mark Hermanson was after him for 15 okay. years, and then the 10 Flint. years are not like they were years ago. Other departments that I've heard of, long time, the, the headships would be quite extensive. Now it doesn't seem to be that long for many departments. Is that right? Well, that's. I mean, you talk to some people maybe five years or six or something, but there's been others that, such as the people you just addressed, were here for, who were heads for a long period. That's right. That's right. I think that the risk you run if you do it for that long is that um, your research uh, suffers. So uh, I, I'm sympathetic to the people who want to step down, and, and Jim Forney did that, decided he was going to step down up to seven years, and I think he's absolutely right to do so. Right. Not that I didn't like him as chair, I think he was right. a terrific right. chair. But, but you I, want to keep your hand in it. But yeah, but I think he was wise to stop when he did. Right. 
and I wouldn't expect Dr. Chappell to to stay on for 15 years, but one never knows. Because he's because he's basically a research person. <laughs> Oh. So those were those were the chairs, and they all had different personalities and did different things. Right. Um, let's talk about your minority access to research. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in that. Yes, that one. That one's uh, something a little distinctive. Uh, How they many of these it. other things, anybody could tell you much similar stories. What happened was the following: that I'm uh, my professional society is the Society of Biological Chemists, and one year the president of the society was a fellow named Alton Meister. Um, and um, I'd known Al because we'd done similar things. And I went to him, I said, you know, I've never done anything in this society, Al. Is there something I can do to help? And he said, well, he says, the only committee assignment I need somebody for is minority affairs. Would you like to sit on that? And I said, sure, why not? So I did, and that must have been uh, in the uh, late 70s, I suppose. And so that was a fascinating thing. And at the time, uh, I got to know the only African-American biochemists in the country, I'm sure, because the, the ones who were doing research were all members of the society, and I knew all, all, all eight of them, probably. Some very small number of people. Oh, yes. And so... Uh, what was the purpose of the committee? It had it already been in operation before you took over the ship? Yes, it had been in operation. Well, it was, it was basically uh, to encourage the participation of uh, minorities, specifically African Americans at that time, into science. And the, the Society of Biological Chemists was way ahead of the other societies. It was some years before uh, any of the other societies um, got interested. Moved in that direction. Moved in that direction, which is an interesting thing. That I, it's been my observation that, that biochemists have always been much more liberal than most of the other scientists that I've ever encountered mm -hmm. uh, in the area of, of civil rights and so forth. It's, it just seems to, seems to come with the territory or something. There's nothing, nothing uh, unusual about sure. me in that regard. Right, I understand. But um, so uh, then I came um, back to Purdue, I guess, and I sat in this committee for a number of years. I, I was just struck by the fact that there just was no representation at all to speak of. And then, um, you know Dwight Lewis, of course. Um, and Dwight, and, uh, and you possibly also remember Luther Williams. Do you go back that far? No, um, Luther, I think... You do go back that far, actually, don't you? Luther, I, I recognize his name, but I never had the occasion to meet him. Okay. But I know he was affiliated with Purdue. Right. He was vice provost. He was, got his degree in biology with uh, Ed Umbarger. In fact, excuse me, his name has been suggested as a possible person that would be good to be interviewed. For oh, I think, he, I think he would be, unquestionably. Um, and then he was vice provost with Phil Hotz, and Phil was doing his best to, uh, to put a little bit of presence out there. Well, um, at one point, Luther and um, Dwight and I all went to a minority science meeting. I started to go to science meetings that were specifically minority oriented, or, or run by minorities. I think it was in Atlanta. And we were sitting around in the um, plane station in Atlanta. Uh, having a, a beer or something, waiting for our plane, and Luther said, um, you know, we ought to start a program like the Merck people started, Merck Company, of you know, bringing some scientists in to work with us. And we said, yeah, that'd be a good idea. He said, I I'll do something about it. And so he recruited six students, all from Savannah State, uh, that first year. This was 80. And uh, they came out, and we did a little program with, with them. So the, the three, there were three people involved in the program, and I just named them. Um, but Luther was the uh, initial uh, starter of that. But then the next year, Luther left and went to a, a succession of careers. He's gone all over the place. I think it was uh, he went to Washington U, St. Louis next. Uh, that's what somebody shared yes. with me. And um, and so that left um, left who the program. Who was the other person? Luther, yourself, and who else? Uh, Dwight Lewis. Oh, and Dwight Lewis. Okay. Yes, Dwight Lewis. What about Darlene Hine? Was she involved in that? No. Well, maybe at some level, late, much later. But, oh, but not uh, at but the initial no, not, stage. Well, no, I don't think Darlene's ever been involved directly in the program while we ran it. No, she may be now. I don't know about that. And so then I took it over, and um, we broadened it uh, to more people. And we're running, and we went up from six students to, you know, 24, 30, sometimes 40 students. This is during the summer that they come? Summer programs, okay. six-week summer program. And um, the philosophy was... Mm -hmm to put the students one-on-one uh, -on -one into research laboratories. I know some programs have put two students in a laboratory, but we, we strictly adhered to only one. Um, well, we just felt that there was enough to, enough to do for a professor to have one 
student in their laboratory extra. And um, the trick here was to um, find the right professors who were going to be re re both receptive to such an idea, but also to do a good job. That those are not necessarily the same thing. And you mentioned Jim Barony, for example. He was a person who met both those criteria very nicely. But nobody, not everybody does. And sometimes you put a student... Not all the way through it. They might say initially, but maybe all exactly, the way through Exactly, exactly. So sometimes, you know, they take a student and then, um, then they go off on vacation and the student be floating. So over the years, um, you develop a cadre of professors who you know are going to do a good job. <laughs> and are willing to participate. And are willing to participate. And also speak about funding. What was the funding coming from? There wasn't any funding. Who paid for the, the students while they were here? I mean, did they oh, get um, oh, w well, expenses? No, no, they, they, the students got paid. Oh. The professors didn't. And so I there was some funding or some support. Was it from the university or from the um, Well, occasionally, sometimes we had grants from uh, the Department of Education, but but the university basically picked it up for okay. the for most part. It's rather funny because when it started out, it was uh, that first year I ran it. Um, I called up the uh, then dean of the graduate school, Strother Arnott, and um, or oh, I, I tried to talk to him. I didn't actually talk to him. And, said, you know, I'm, I'm paying for these phone calls off my grant, you know, to try and recruit students. Is there any possibility I could get some money for phone calls? And the assistant dean said, um, I think it would be inadvisable to trouble the dean about this. I was asking for $50. <laughs> so, uh, but Strother later, later came around and decided it was a good program. And other deans of graduate school, all of them, have been highly supportive of the program. They weren't initially. But we sort of did it on a shoestring. I mean, it was just a question of phone calls and paperwork. But then the job got a little complicated because we were, we were trying to keep track of what everybody was doing uh, subsequently. How was the, uh, the numbers? Did they vary? Did you set a, a particular number per summer? Did it increase? Yeah, yeah. You knew what your budget was. Okay. And I generally just exceeded it and then, then, then went and said, I'm sorry, I overstepped the budget. So we didn't have much of a budget for anything. I think I might have got some money from uh, so from P Procter and Gamble for social affairs. Yes, we could get a thousand dollars here, thousand dollars there from various companies. P and G on a couple of times has done that. I think Merck gave us a little money once and then said no, no did more. You, did you do the recruiting? You contacted the schools, or how did mm -hmm. you get mm -hmm. your, the students? Um, well, I, I traveled around the country. Uh, fortunately, I sat on another committee, a National Institutes of Health committee, um, which was. Um, uh, research aside, uh, wait a minute, which was concerned with research in minority institutions. So I, I, I actively tried to sit on committees which were Here's in business of visiting minority institutions. So that gave me an opportunity to visit them. And so I became a known person to uh, the scientists in these institutions. So that for coming to Purdue for the program. Exactly. And then what happened was. Um, we started this, Luther started in 88, so from 81 onwards uh, I was directing it. And then after a year or two, uh, some other universities started to take an interest, almost, in, almost invariably biochemists, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, one was Davis, for example, and I know there was a professor there, so they'd write and say, you know, how does this work, tell us about it. And another one was Miami, I don't remember, there were a number of them. So I. So one of the things I did was share all our information with them. I told them what, what we did and what worked and what didn't work and so forth. Very helpful. And that, of course, created a lot of competition. Uh, so that that uh, sort of decreased uh, the pool from which uh, Purdue could draw because at the time, University of Cincinnati and Purdue were it, you know. And now, but then everybody caught them. Then, you know, the students from the South, they'd much rather go to Miami than to, to Lafayette, Indiana, right? So. Uh, so Miami, you have to wait till Miami fills up, and th then you see what happens. But uh, but we've had a good reputation over the years, and we we've stressed sciences and engineering um, to the exclusion of many fields. And the 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 um, the mantra has not mantra. Uh, the the criterion has been: uh, is there a shortage of minority institutions? Excuse me, of minority faculty in this particular area? So that uh, for sciences, all of them, and engineering, the answer is emphatically yes. For teaching, it is not emphatically yes. So that we have not taken people in, in teaching. Um, we have not tended to take people in communications either. I may step onto your toes at some point. And occasionally library science, but not generally speaking. 
and once in a while in English, if, if it's English literature and history, because there are shortages there too, but the overall emphasis has been sciences. At some point during the years, we 22 years or so, my, oh, then I should say after a while my wife started helping me out, right? And so... Um, yes, I heard that. And uh, then uh, really I, it ended up with my working for her. <laughs> so she took it over. And it was initially interesting uh, because um, uh, I guess it was when um, our dean and vice president who died, whose name begins with an R, whom I oh, think... Ringle. Ringle. Bob Ringle was dean at the time. And um, I went to her and I said, you know, uh, this get, oh, I was there for 10 years. I did it for 10 years. And I said, uh, you know, Bob, uh, 10 years is a lot of time. I, I think I'd like to turn this over to somebody else. And um, it's very difficult to find somebody who wants to do this. I can appreciate that. He said, well, what can I do to persuade you? He said, I'll give you some relief time, and, and you know, you don't have to do so much teaching. I said, well, you know, that's okay. I, I, I like my teaching. I don't really want to do that. And um, I, I said, what you could do is, in some way, you could, could you possibly recompense my wife for the amount of time she puts in on this sort of thing? And, uh, he said, oh, he said, I know. He said, I could give you a secretary in the graduate school. And I said, well, that really doesn't do me any good because I don't do this in the daytime. I do it in the evenings. And, uh, and and on the weekends, you know, it's a hobby. I, I don't use departmental facilities too much for this. Uh, and he eventually worked it out that he uh, added Meredith to the graduate school faculty and gave her a desk where she never sat in, and she worked from home. <laughs> so he worked it out. <laughs> so 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 that she got well. Actually, she had a half-time teaching assistant. I think it paid her eight thousand dollars a year. Not very much, but. Uh, but, you know, it's different to get something. And she loved it. Uh, she, when we stopped the program, it was, it was a bigger withdrawal symptom for her than it was for me. I was willing to give it up. And I was kept nearing yeah, retirement. Right. And, uh, but it, it, it pained her more. She said, oh, no. <laughs> she really identified with the kids. And she enjoyed it very much. She enjoyed it enormously. And it was a wonderful experience for her because she sort of ran our group meetings and things. And she went, my wife's a basically a shy person um, to, to a person who's perfectly happy uh, in a, to get up in an audience of entirely minority individuals and talk to them and, 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 and be comfortable. So it was and have a, a good, enjoyable time. And have an enjoyable time. And in fact, the most, the most valuable um, side benefit of this program has been uh, on the professors, the changing their attitudes about um, what specifically black African Americans are capable of doing um, because they hadn't met any, you know? So, so it's, I think it's involved over 600 Purdue professors at some, at some level over the years. So I think the impact has been fairly substantial, uh, if indirect, haul. over the long haul sure. on, the, on the faculty at large. Right. And certainly it's been benefits to the students. A lot of them are PhDs, a lot of them are professors now, and, and so on. I was going to ask you, do you what's the follow-up? Do you keep in touch with them? Or well, we did. Okay. But, but since we've stopped running it, I think they have not found the time to do that. It's, it's a very time-consuming job to keep up over the years. Every year you add 30 students, and their email addresses run out and stuff like that. So, but did some uh, of them uh, apply at Purdue did, did, over the period of time? Did you get them? Oh yes, oh right. yes, oh sure. Good. Yeah, we Good. try to get them to come to oh, Purdue. Oh sure, I understand. In fact, the graduate school, you know, oh, sure. that's that, that <laughs> they're happy if we do that. Right. And so we've been very successful in that regard. Uh, more. Most successful in PhD completions with the Hispanic community, but that's partially because we drew our Hispanic community from Puerto Rico very largely, and Puerto Rico is a sort of a different situation. Are you a minority student in Puerto Rico? Not really. I mean, all the students in Puerto Rico are Hispanics, aren't they? It's not quite the same. So a Hispanic in New York, a Puerto Rican in New York is one thing, and a Puerto Rican in, in Rio Piedras is something else again. Plus, they have some very good schools over there. So a lot of their students uh, have done better, some, some of them, than, uh, than the success rate among African Americans has not been quite as startlingly good, but it's not been bad. Sure, interesting. And in fact, one is, um, oh, that's right, I can't find the thesis now. It's Wanda Jordan came to me and got her degree with me, who's an African American lady, um, and she's been very successful. She was a professor and associate dean down at Xavier University in New Orleans, 
but then Katrina came along. And um, what happened to her then? Well, it, it sort of wiped out LSU and Xavier and these other things, and she moved to. Um, fortunately, her parents were still living in in, in the Greater Baltimore area, and she moved back there, and. Um, started working with the people in the Howard Hughes Medical Research Institute and spent a lot of time trying to use uh, Hughes money to provide sabbatical leaves for faculty from Xavier University while the university was non-functional. And then Howard Hughes offered her, created her a new job and um, she is um, in charge of a program to um, encourage student interest in the sciences, not just minority students, but students in general. And we had her back here the year before last, or last year, as a distinguished alum of the School of Agriculture. So I'm very pleased. Yeah. So she's done very well. So there's, 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 a, there's a real success for her. But that's my only, that's my only minority student, um, only African-American student, I should say. Uh, none of them ever wanted to work for me. But uh, that, that's okay. <laughs> they gave presentations at the end, didn't they? That's right. Uh, we, we insisted everybody give a presentation. And um, I, I always went to all the presentations. And uh, always had at least one question for everybody. That's very good. I so, need the question. Yes, you got to have a question. It's not too difficult. <laughs> and that, that was a lot of fun because, you know, um, I remember one year, one of the most interesting papers was uh, somebody who worked in the history department who was a Hispanic lady. And she was um, uh, she was directed to um, write a paper on the use of um, Spanish law by the southwestern Indians uh, to uh, to contest property gain uh, property um, litigation uh, regarding uh, 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 with the U.S. government because the Spanish law you know predated the predated the uh, the U.S. law in this area and so she was do reading a lot of um, 17th century and 18th century his, uh, Spanish documents and so forth. And I thought that was just fascinating. Yeah, that yeah really uh, eye-opening too, but a lot of research was really cool. Yeah, so, so one of the nice things was, yes, it's nice to listen to the sciences, but sometimes I had the most fun listening to... Something this, a little bit different. Something a little bit different, right, you know? Right. Yeah. What about the program? Is it, is it still continuing? Yes, but I'm really out of touch with what it's doing. You need to talk to John's story about that if you're interested. Um, just out of curiosity, but you, yeah. uh, when did you step? Did was the program still going when you stepped down? Or yes, uh, okay. in fact, Ron Coolbar ran it. You know Ron, do you, from uh, um, so. Botany and Plant Path? Uh, he had run a similar program in the Ag School. Oh, I should say, <laughs> at various points during the career, various schools said, "Oh, that's a good idea. Let's have our own program." And I like the Science School had one. And after a while, they got tired of running it and said, "Why don't we just lump it in with you?" And that happened several times. Engineering did it over a period of time. Over a period of time, sure. they do it for a couple of years, and they think, "Wait a minute, <laughs> let's just put it, make it all one program." Sure. Right. So Ron ran it for a while, and then he stepped down. I think. Um, let's see, he ran it for two years, and then I think um, John Story. Well, John Story ran it this last year, and I don't know because I'm totally out of the loop. Okay, okay, just interesting then. Um, let's talk about strategic plan. Uh, mm -hmm. Any comments on that? Yet? Harvard and the university has one too. Well, uh, I'm really not, um, I have not been involved in university level politics uh, or planning, I should say. And um, at the department too. level or the school level either. Um, mm -hmm. I, mean, I sat in the policy and agenda committee with this dean for a while, but um, uh, biochemistry has sort of over the years been pretty peripheral to everything else that's going on. Okay. It's not very agricultural. None of us, most of us don't come from so an agricultural background. It crosses even. a little bit. Pardon? It crosses a little bit with certain, uh, crosses over maybe their similarities other departments. I'm not quite sure your question. Um, it, it was in the School of Agriculture, mm -hmm. correct? Oh, yes. yes. It, it, it has, uh, it, 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 has used, it finds applications in all the other fields. That's what I mean. And in more recent years, I mean, there's lots of molecular biology, biochemistry going on in fields like entomology, sure. for example, and right. botany and plant path. That was not always the case, but... Right. But, um, but that's what's happened over time. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it's uh, so that, um, yeah, it's, it's a much more respected discipline now than it was initially, I, I was think. Was it ever was in the sciences, or has it always been in the agriculture? It's always been in agriculture, and the reason for that, I think, is historic. Uh, and 
not restricted to Purdue, but um, I think in all the land-grant colleges, you'll find that the biochemistry department was, and in many cases still is, in the ag school. And the reason for that, I think, is that this goes back to the 1870s, and at the time, people thought, hmm, soil chemistry has a lot to do with um, good crop yield. So they said, we've got to have a... Uh, we've got to have somebody who's good in, in this area so they can talk about the nutrition of soil and so forth. So like this building was agricultural chemistry for many years. Right. So that's the reason I think that say Iowa and Wisconsin and all the land grant schools uh, have had it in the, in the um, ag school. Now some of the schools also have a medical school like Wisconsin in which case uh, they have a department there. And that also is historical that the Eastern schools, which are not land-grant, like Harvard and so forth, the um, biochemistry grew out of medical physiology. And that was true in Oxford and England, too, grew out of medical physiology. And so it's in, been in the medical school, whereas here it grew out of soil chemistry. Right. Being, and it comes out, I would say, uh, following up what you're saying, that being the land-grant institution, and you're talking about soil chemistry, it figures it has to be within the ag. Yeah, right. So, yeah. That, so that, it makes all that's sense. where the foundation is, where that's it comes right. from. Foundation. Exactly. And so, uh, so yes, but our, our but our collaborative relationships are really with the more minor have always been with the School of Science, and sure. that's true of many of my colleagues, sure. but also in the ag school. Right. Okay. Let's talk about uh, Chauncey Village. How that's changed over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Not as much as I'd like to see. <laughs> well, I've heard that it's built on, and of course the levee has all changed, even since I've been here. But uh, you well, the levee's additions is very positive. I think every time I go down to the village, I think this is a crummy dump. Still, I really don't like it. Uh, a lot I mean, of things that were there. The only really good thing is bonds, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and there used to be, I remember ours was there, and they had a post a substation there, you know, postal substation, yeah. which was really kind of nice. Yes, and, it was. Uh, yeah, can't even find a mailbox now, can you? <laughs> really? uh, yes, it's, uh, particularly if I go to a place like Madison or, uh, to, say, to Michigan, and you see what the downtown's like there, you think, oh boy. So it's better. They at least paved it a bit, but but it's. Uh, it's got all kinds of mix mixes in there. <laughs> well, I see it a lot because my wife and I play, play bridge uh, frequently at the uh, community center, and in between hands, if we're not doing anything, we always walk through the village. Okay. And uh, get your exercise right. Get my exercise down there. <laughs> oh. But but the, the but the development down the hill has been a real plus. No question about it. All they've got to do now is figure a safe way to get there on foot, and they haven't worked that out yet, have they? We even have to be careful around here crossing the streets, you know, you zap, yeah. and you, sometimes the light is so quick that you can hardly get across the street when you push the button on some of the crosswalk things. Yes. I experienced that the other day. Northwestern and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, Stadium, yes. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about your awards and honors. You got that one brick higher. And that's oh, yes, that's nice. That's a nice Yes, that's very bit. nice. And um, how did that, how, were you, I usually ask people, were you surprised, or how did you find out about it? Um, I have to find out about it. I don't remember. Um, I, I, That's very I, nice. I, I suspect That's Kent, a I unique did, award that Jesse started. Yeah, I suspect Candace Bibbitt had a lot to do with that. Candy and I had worked together when she was in the graduate school, um, and I have a very high regard for her. Uh, you know her at all? Yes. She's, she's a nice. very savvy individual. I, I must very say. Nice. And um, I had numerous occasions. Um, she worked with the Minority Science Program. She was, she was our contact in grad school over the years. And sometimes I had, you know, sort of ethical questions that I was wondering about or, or problems with students. And I sometimes call, call up Candy and say, what do you think about this? What do you think we should do? And, and of course, she worked as, uh, as Jiski's um, administrative assistant, right? So I suspect that Candy did it. Yeah, that's very nice. Were there any other awards that you, care to that you received over time? Any comments? Yes. The one I got that I'm most proud of is this one. I'll show it to you. This one I really like. I mean, the... Yeah, the, uh, the other one was nice too. This one I like. Tell it on the tape so they'll. Oh, yeah, um, the Outstanding Graduate Educator Award. Awarded each year the Outstanding Graduate Educator in the Purdue University School of Agriculture 2004. Very nice. And uh, since I spent most of my time doing graduate education, uh, that, that was really a delight and a big surprise. There were 10 candidates, and I didn't for one minute think that they would pick me, but they did. So, uh, so that yes, I'm really happy with that. You should hang it up. Well, pictures instead. <laughs> they've got a copy. They've got a copy hanging downstairs. 
<laughs> That's enough. Uh, how about your post Purdue activities? Can you share something with us? Oh, yeah, there it is. That's the, that's the brick wall. This is brick the one brick higher wall. One brick Looking higher wall. Looking at very yes. nice. I got a um, very nice. Yeah, I forgot it was back there. Yeah, very nice. Move it to the front of the desk there. <laughs> it's enough. Uh, your post retirement activities, what sort of have been involved in since you retired from the church? Well, I con continued to sing in the church choir. Um, I have a lab here, and um, at least for, until this year, I've uh, done a fair amount of work with um, graduate students, primarily from Sydney Stoppaker's group. Um, what tended to happen over the years is that um, when, she, when the students started out, Cindy would say, why don't you go over to Vic's lab and learn to do some enzymology, and then come back and we'll do some structural work. And that's worked out very well, so I have good relationships with them. In fact, the guy I was writing an email to when you came in as a postdoc in her laboratory, for example, um, so that's been one of the things. Uh, my wife and I play bridge. Um, we're, we're off to Italy for two weeks in, on Monday, so we like to travel, and uh, like most people, and um, visit kids. And Have you been to Italy before? Oh, yes, numerous Any times. Any particular spot that you're, going, that you're going to this time, or have you been to Well, we, we take a bus tour each time, uh, and uh, we go where the bus goes. Okay. But uh, I, I definitely want to go to Florence, and I said to Meredith, I'm going back up the Duomo again. Do you want to come up? <laughs> I said, the view up there is so good, I don't want to miss it. So I want to go to Florence again and Venice. Yeah, that's and uh, Ravenna, we've never been to Ravenna, so we'd we'll like to see that. But uh, you can't go wrong in Italy, right? No, I don't think so. Sounds lots, good to Lots me. to see and lots to eat. You've there not is. been there, have you? Oh, a number of years ago. Yeah, and well. Then, so I like to go back sometime. Yeah. Maybe I will. Yeah. It's on my list, anyway. Oh, and um, my hobby also in England is canal boating. I think... Um, we have a shared ownership boat that looks like that. Um, there's a picture of a boat. Um, it's a, sort of like a houseboat. Um, just a minute. Um, Where's the boat located? The boat's in England, and it's... Um, it's in the winter. He's well, showing me a picture the of picture it. The picture that I showed you is a winter shot. Okay. Um, the boat is a 58-foot-long um, um, liveaboard. You could you could live all year on it uh, if you could stand if you could stand living all year in a confined space like that. Some people do live quite a few people do live for the year, but what we are we're part owners with 11 uh, English couples, and um, we get three weeks a year on this boat, and we share all the expenses, of course. Uh, and um, I'll be going. We, we were there this spring for two weeks. And then I'm going back in early October and spend another week there uh, cruising on our boat. Is it on inland waters? Is that where? It's inland waters, they're canals. The, the, uh, unlike, um, well, as you know, we're on the path of uh, one of the truly great canals, the Wabash and Erie, which is really, I would say, the biggest, the longest canal there is. The China claims a longer canal, but, it, but it's canal collected by lakes. And if you add in lakes, it's longer. But the Wabash and Erie is, what, 430 or something like that. It's a colossal canal. But it's all filled in, except for that little bit down the Delphi. Right. Uh, but in England, they, um, the canals were still in use commercially, at least somewhat, uh, through the Second World War. And then after the Second World War, there was a revival of interest in the canals as recreational facilities. And since the Second World War, there's been an enormous amount of money spent and, and volunteer effort put into restoring the canals to, uh, to an operational thing. So at the moment, there are something like 4,000 miles of navigable waterway in England, including rivers. So you can cruise and, and not, not, not repeat yourself for quite some time. And uh, there are thousands of canal boats on there, uh, some pri privately owned, rented, or in some cases like ours, communally owned. And it's, um, it's very nice because it's all... Um, it's all owner-operated. The locks are, are, are 18th century locks, and um, and you run them yourself. And uh, people What a nice trip. Yes, it's very relaxing because um, the, the boat will not go more than four miles an hour. If you go through a lock, it takes 15 minutes, and if you were in a hurry, you'd walk. So, 
so you don't hurry. And the nice thing about that is the other people who are on the waterways are clearly not in a hurry either. So it's a very laid back group of people. And the other thing is you can drink and drive. <laughs> right. So most of them have a, most of us have a glass of beer in our hands. So, so where, yeah. do you, where do you keep the boat? Where is it kept? Well, it, 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 there are various oh. marinas oh, around, okay. and uh, de- depending on what year it is and what the owners decide to do, sure. it's one place or another. Right. We're up near Manchester at the moment. Okay. Oh, that's very nice. So, I enjoyed that. Uh, what about got a favorite Purdue tradition that comes to mind? Favorite or? Purdue tradition. Comes to mind. I always like the senior um, chords. Uh, they came back for a while, didn't they? And then they disappeared. I thought that was a very nice tradition. Yes. Very harm- harmless and uh, very colorful. Yes. We have a couple that were given in the archives in special collections. One's a skirt with the gals, mm-hmm, and we have mm-hmm. a pair of the yeah, pants, too, as the well. Girls ones. Yeah, But that came back, what, about 15, 10, 12 years ago, wasn't it? Something like that? But short-lived. Yes. I wonder yeah. why that was. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I would say that was something I really liked. Uh-huh. How about uh, an outstanding event? one of those that you'd like to share with the researchers? Of Purdue. An outstanding event. In your life. An outstanding event could be at Purdue or anything that comes to mind. Well, I thought getting that research award was was pretty special for me, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm reminded that, um, and this is not a Purdue event, that um, we are, of course, on the anniversary of the collapse of the Twin Towers, right? And all of us know where we were when that happened. Well, interestingly uh, for us, uh, I was in England at the time on our canal boat just outside Coventry. And one of my friends called the phone on the boat and said, Vic, turn on the TV. And this was on, oh, I forget what day of the week it was. Was it a Thursday? I don't, I don't remember. Somewhere towards the end of the week. And um, so we were supposed to fly out of um, Heathrow Airport that Saturday. And, of course, all the flights were canceled and so forth. So we were sitting around um, Heathrow Airport. And oddly enough, we got out on, um, uh, on the first flight possible, which really surprised me. And our tickets were marked OP. And my wife says, what, OP? And I said, well, undoubtedly means old people. They're going to give us preference to get out of here. <laughs> you don't want to put any of that in. Uh, but it was, uh, that was a signal event in, in anybody's life, wasn't it? As was the Kennedy assassination or the attack on Pearl Harbor, those kinds of things. Right. Those were the big events, weren't they? That's right, exactly. Any closing comments for the research that you'd like to share? Anything special comes to mind? Well, I think one thing that um, is troublesome to me is that the uh, research support picture has got pretty bleak. Um, and it was not so, not so difficult to get research grants for most of my career. And that's made things extremely hard for young professors. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's the, the competition is such that I think it's distracting for them. Uh, they have to spend a lot of time writing grants uh, that would be better spent doing other things. So um, I think I'd like to see our government put far more resources into supporting basic research than it presently is doing. Is, is that address, does that address no, your question right. at all? No, no, I, it, that, uh, that's, it, that's what looking at it from, the, from an academic standpoint, yeah. which is very key. Yeah, to um, so I mean, I think that our young people have it much tougher than I did uh, in, 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 uh, in many respects. Uh, more is expected of them earlier. Whoops. Hi. I'll be doing that. I'll come by later. Um, Ask the question again, please. Uh, just some closing comments that uh, you just shared with that you'd like to share with the research event that comes to mind. Well, I, I've had a very, I've had a very happy career at Purdue. Um, when I left, um, when I came here, um, I had the impression that a colleague was somebody who was trying to steal my space or my graduate students, and I sort of mentally walked into a faculty meeting mentally smashing a beer bottle over the side of a table and saying, come and get me, you son of a gun. And the whole atmosphere at Purdue has never been like that. We've been a very placid, friendly department. I've never felt that any of my colleagues was out to get me. Uh, Quite the contrary. I think all my colleagues have been highly supportive here. We support equipment. We have keys to each other's laboratories. Uh, 
and we we're just support each other in every in every way. And the biochemistry faculty has usually been pretty much of one mind when it comes to say academic requirements or things like that. So it really didn't matter who we sent to represent us; it would have amounted to the same thing. So in that respect, I've been very fortunate. I I, I think that's pretty unusual that, that most people have not had a, a career in a department where they felt. Uh, completely at ease, and where people left you like long to do your thing, you know. Yeah, All my chairmen have tended to do that, they sort of, I'll worry about the paperwork, you just do what you're supposed to do type stuff. Right. And that, that's, that's been great, so it's been, it's been a great career in that regard. I've been extraordinarily fortunate. And you're continuing to come in every, as often as you can. Well, um, it's it's starting to starting to die down now because there isn't anything much to do. Um, so, and I don't want to start any new projects because I'm. We have a place in Florida now, and when the winter when the winter gets cold, I'm out of here. So, and I used to act a lot. I, I acted at the Civic Theater, but the trouble is, I, I, number one, they don't get, don't get too many parts of my age. But the other thing is, it's in the it's in the winter time, so I really couldn't do it anymore. That's something else. Oh, I like to work at Civic. That's another thing. I, but what I do is uh, work on set construction. That's okay. a lot of fun. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So you asked about hobbies earlier on, didn't you? I forgot I think about so. that. That's very yeah, nice. I tried directing and doing various things in theater. I like theater a lot. Very good. I want to thank you very much, Professor Rodney. This concludes a very nice. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank My you. pleasure.